came back for you come on you know like it was something between them like a soul thing and um so he went away and then they he was embarrassed because there were other people there for the ritual for the first time that didn't get any information and so it was a failure for them on that but and it, it was time specific like there was only a he said we have to do it now by 11 like it, there was a they couldn't just do this whip it out and wait till next thursday and do it again like it was time specific they had only one only a few minutes out of the year that they could make contact with this being in this manner with uh children or whoever was taking that that hallucinogen so this was more of a science it was more of a technology than a spiritual belief is what i'm saying so and this was this was what and obviously like it, Again, uh, you know, when I'm making, trying to make sense of all these things that I remember during my, in the last six years, I went back and researched it. And when you look at ritual human sacrifice, I mean, what, what do you think about that? Like ritual human sacrifice, like you're working with people, like what, like, why would somebody do that? Uh, well, uh, since you're asking my opinion, um, Human sacrifice has a, a lot of uh, spiritual ramifications. First of all, the, the, the fear, the pain, the torment um, of the person dying actually fuels the atmosphere. So if, you, if these occultists want to conjure something up or summon a being and, and bring it in, um, it, power up a portal or, or so on and so forth like that that release of human blood and that slaughtering of human life puts a lot of power in the atmosphere to accomplish those ends um they also there's a lot of associations to the blood and the body fluids that uh, the occultists lean into like they drink the blood they they consume the body fluids it's 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 a requirement for a lot of these rituals to have that ingested to pass it around put drugs in it mix it up um it it uh you know in a lot of their beliefs like consuming some of this blood type eating people even the cannibalism is actually taking on that person's life force. So they, they think they'll have like longer life themselves, be stronger. Like it, it, it's really sick stuff, but they believe it. Um, so, so the reason I asked is because I couldn't make my, I couldn't get my head around it. I, I had these memories of the, how this happened and I could not get my head around this. Like, where did they learn to do this? How could they have done that? And I, um, Whatever. When, for my first live talk, I started researching it and I wanted to talk about slavery and how it's legal because of the 13th Amendment. But I went in a different direction. And what I found was that I thought, um, OK, so like in the Bible, um, was it Abraham was supposed to kill it, sacrifice his son. Remember that? And I thought, man, they were doing it in the Bible. So what, where was this in history? And I found that pretty much everybody sacrificed people. Ritual human sacrifice was global prior to Christianity. In fact, that is what that is one of the main things that Christianity accomplished was getting rid of ritual human sacrifice. The Hawaiians did it. The in, American Indians did it. The Irish were sacred. The pagans uh, all across Europe. The Huns, the Mongolians, the Asians did it. Japanese did it. Everybody was committing ritual human sacrifice in a ritual manner. They were sacrificing people and they were eating them. And this was all around the globe. The, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that it was that widespread. When I started researching it and started Googling it, getting in the articles, the entire globe ritually was sacrificing people, either enemies of war or people that didn't stand out in the, you know, for whatever reason. And some of them were sacrificing their best and brightest. They were sacrificing the not not the prisoners, and th there was a story about the fall of um, Carthage. Fall of Carthage. I'm getting that right. Sorry, it's late, but it, they had gotten rid of. They had made it illegal to ritual sacrifice the Carth Carthaginians. But when the Romans were coming, right when they realized that there was no way out, they realized that they were going to be conquered. They began to sacrifice their children to try to get figure out a way. 
Um, so that's what Jesus did after the end. He had the Last Supper. They said, what are we going to do after they kill you? Are we going to eat you? Should we eat you? That's really the question that came up that night. And he said, no, you're going to drink whenever you, you're never going to do that ever again. No more sec, no more eating people. You drink the wine and you, the body, my body and my, you, you, I'm sure you know the story, but that's what he did. And when, wherever Christianity went and took hold, that was the main, um, where they butted heads with paganism was that you were no longer allowed to eat people with Christianity. It's, it's a fact that fell by the white, like it's a, it, it's a fact and you can look at, you can research this, but it's fallen to the wayside because they don't want you to know about ritual human sacrifice because they're still doing it. So for whatever scientific reason that it is, the other thing I'll say is that the, the first night I was there, I w- had been through, and, when, and now back to Seattle, 10 years old, fresh out of Inyo Kern and fresh out of the uh, mind fracturing and just, you know, the sleep deprivation and everything. So I was mentally broken. I was not really all there. That first night I witnessed a ritual human sacrifice. And he said, you either, and he had a fancy um, cup with their blood and he was draining the blood out of a child that was younger than me, uh, probably a five or six year old boy that I saw was my first kid ever. And he made us drink some and eat some. And he said, if you refuse, you're going to go up there right next to him. It makes no difference to me. He explained, he's, he's with his, um, with his mask on, with his Baphomet mask on. He looked down, I'm looking up at him and I'm 10 years old and I did not have the words to argue with him or do anything. So whatever I did, but the, the, what's interesting and of note, and I hope I got this right in the book. Cause I can't really remember how, how I, what I wrote it in the book, but the next morning, about 4 or 5 a.m., I woke up before the sun came up, and I was smart. I, I began to plot my escape. I remembered where, how far it was to the boats, to the ferry, and I, I began to formulate a plan for my escape. And as the sun came up and it wore off, I went back to being stupid. And I no longer, I never got that again. And I realized that there was no way I could figure out to escape. Like I didn't have the faculty, but oh, for a few matter of hours, I had the mental faculty to do that. So I did it. If is it from the ritual? Is it from some other drug? I don't know. I mean, but if you look at it, if you, then I, I connected that with historical events, you got to think about the whole adrenochrome thing where they scare kids. We had this recently about the, Yep. You know, there've been videos, whatever. It's a lot about it. Yep. But from what I experienced in that regard, it seems to be real. And that if they take a kid and scare it and there's adrenaline and then there's a drug released and it makes you smarter. And so if you think about that kind of technology, oh, the movie, there's that movie. Uh, oh, wow. It's on the tip of my tongue. I got to get this movie where they, uh, he takes the drug and he gets smarter. Um. Bradley Cooper is in it, and it's I like he think takes, I I remember they what take you're those pills. About. They yeah. take pills and they can't get it, and they can't get off the drug because it, it makes them sick. What is that movie called? I um, can't. I don't remember the name. Limitless. I mean, I, Limitless. Limitless. The movie's called Limitless. And so, if you look at that, the movie is basically a tale of adrenochrome. It's the tale of uh, of them killing little kids and drinking the blood. That's the deal. That's the same drug. That's what's going on. And at the end of the movie, he's going out, he's on his way to Washington because when you get really smart, you get bodyguards and you go and take power rather than fortune. He went and made a fortune real quick. And then, so I think we have a lot of our leaders, a lot of the politicians had access to this tech ancient technology of being smarter, you know, and I think it started out not, you know, when you roll back into 6,000 years ago, there were tribal communities you know, eating people was a necess- necessity, right? They ran into droughts and times where they didn't have food and somebody died and there was a dead body there and we're made out of food. So I think that it, that's how the discovery was made. And it was a well, practice that was global. You know, and, and, and I mean, for the hardcore researchers, you know, there's also a huge connection to um, what the Bible describes as the Nephilim, these uh, pre-flood, or you could call them antediluvian giants, they were eating people. I mean, it was, they would eat people. They Mm -hmm. ate people. And uh, the, the, a lot of these Canaanite religions that came later on, I mean, they continued. And of course we have uh, another biblical situation with Moloch 
And, mm -hmm. um, you know, they actually had a statue of Moloch, I was told on Epstein Island, but, um, you know, Moloch was, they, it was basically a grill where they, they would put wood in the arms and turn the wood on. And then they put the babies on the arms that were heated up by it and it would just grill them alive. We called it passing through the fire. Um, and, and it was a day at the office for those people. Like the society was okay with this. That's yeah. the thing that we, it's so hard to understand. There was a, a movie. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, Dune. It came out mm -hmm. recently. And so it was a remake. Um, and mm -hmm. they have this, this awful scene, right? Um, where they, they actually have a lot of the step pyramids, ziggurats, and, and like the Mayans, and they have bodies, of humans, you would assume, um, that are dead or dying, and they're draining the blood into the step pyramids uh, to power up the army that's about to go to war, right? Giant, massive human sacrifice ritual right there pg-13 but this is <laughs> they, 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 they're telling you like th this is how we get power that that's this is how we power up evil things that we want to do um which is what they i mean every case like i talk to a lot of people that witness human sacrifice in these contexts and yeah it's the same thing so i yeah i haven't really i so i don't really work with i work with people that people reach out to me and I do consultations and I work with people that were basically ET contacts. Yes, they had some kind of either military extraterrestrial, you know, I was taken, it was the military and then there was an ET there and I don't remember vaguely what happened. So I work with people a lot, but not a lot of SRA people. Um, it's all completely, those people seem to be like in a different um, community that what, what's exposed to, to my information. Um, so, but um, that was a huge I'm sorry. No, go no, down. it's okay. I, just, I want to say that in the beginning, some things that I'd remembered, I, like I didn't have great accuracy in the first six months of my, the memories were still coming and not, not really making sense. And just over time, they kind of, the more, you know, as they filled in it, the, the timeline did. But in the beginning, one of the researchers didn't want to work with me because I got a few things wrong about um, the spaceships. I got some facts wrong about the spaceships, about a about a incident that happened in the solar system. So I got some facts wrong. He checked it on somebody else who turned out to not be as reliable as we thought. But he quit working with me, and I went on to work with another researcher who was an SRA researcher. And it turns out that the things that I said about the rituals, she said, there's no way you could have known that if you weren't a Satanist. So there were things that I described inside the ritual that said, there's no way, nobody knows that. And you have to be actually be, you know, and I'm not a Satanist. I can prove that. And, you know, I've never dabbled with any of that stuff. So that actually got me back on the radar. It was a very, um, uh, it was a point of evidence. So, you know, when you come out with somebody's an abductee, they have to have evidence. So any point of evidence is a kind of a big deal. So anyhow, I just wanted to mention that, that it was confirmed through somebody that was a practicing Satanist, that a former practicing Satanist, in the, pretty high up in the temple of uh set no, i forget i forget the name of it goodness but the, it's, it's, and, and from my view uh the worlds overlap that's and and, and in your story they certainly did um it, it, it's just okay very very fascinating how you walked through in, in your book all of these different aspects of your story connecting them in a narrative that's linear and so so from there i want to kind of you know talk about the next linear part of the story which is all right so we, we we went to the house and there were rituals and there was satanism stuff i mean they might have been, been satanists they might have been some other group we, it doesn't really seem to be clear what they actually were they were evil then they shipped you to Peru and there was that part of your story. And then they sent you back to the house. Mm -hmm. And all of this actually predates space. Right. So walk us, and here's what I'm going to do, because what we're going to do is we're going to run out of time. So I'm going to have you start walking us through, and then we're going to find an extraordinarily inconvenient point in the story to press pause. And then we're going to have you back, but not yet. 